Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Bhavika Oday Nani, and this is the second session of keynote speakers of AmCon 2020. I welcome you all to this session, and I also welcome Dr. Hitesh Chavra, uh, who will be our next speaker. We'll be starting the session soon.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bhavika Uday Nani, and on behalf of entire AMCON committee, I welcome you all to the second session of keynote speakers. We'll begin in two minutes.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I welcome you all to this second session of AMCON keynote speakers. My name is Bhavika Uday Nani, and uh, this is the second half of the keynote speakers. We'll begin shortly. Firstly, I'll begin with the introduction of our speaker. It's my privilege to introduce to you our next speaker for today. He is a man who uh, he is a man who is a renowned name in the field of liver surgery. He'll be speaking with us, uh, sharing his knowledge on the topic, exciting world of liver surgery. He's a surgeon who, uh, who specializes in digestive surgeries, but his main areas of interest being liver cancer, liver transplantation, and ge complex gastrointestinal surgeries. Complex gastrointestinal surgeries. He's a surgeon specializing in these fields. He underwent many sharpenings that paved his way to um, take him to the place where he is today. He began his journey in medicine with his graduation and MS honors in Gujarat University and went on to receive his advanced surgical training and his FRC, uh, FRSC from the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, UK. He also received many fellowships and further training from Paris, Heidelberg, uh, Asian Medical Center for Liver Disease and Liver Transplantation, Singapore, and even Assam Medical Center, Seoul, South Korea. He's been uh, associated with Sterling Hospital as a surgeon since 2002. Furthermore, he has been the one that he has been one driving force to coordinate efforts in starting the cadaveric liver surgery, liver transplantation in Gujarat, particularly in Ahmedabad. In Ahmedabad, he's part of many scientific bodies, has presented and has been a speaker at many national meets. And furthermore, he himself has also been organizing a conference named Lever Update since 2009, the aim of which is to educate the young surgeons on the techniques and peculiarities of liver surgery. Well, to go on, I can continue describing his credentials to you, but let the man speak for himself. So please welcome none other than Dr. Hitesh Chavra. Thank you, uh, Bhavika, uh, for your kind words. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, sir, we can see your screen. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible properly? Yes, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I thank Kedi Hospital, uh, NHS, uh, Municipal Medical College, uh, and MCON 2020 for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to speak on the modern liver surgery. Uh, since uh, when we did the residency uh, at civil hospital, we hardly used to do any liver surgery at that time. But later on, uh, we got ourselves trained and this has become our area of interest. So if you see liver surgery, it has evolved dramatically in last 30, 40 years. There has been a huge development in the field of technologies, a lot of uh, uh, innovations in the field of imaging, and liver surgery has become much, much safer. Now, there are a lot of technical gadgets that we are using to make this surgery safer, and it has become uh, a routine surgeries now. If you see the mortality, uh, because of this, this operation in the previous years, the mortality used to be very, very high because of post-operative liver failure, because of the bleeding, and now if you see in the recent years, the, the most of the centers, the mortality after major liver surgery is quite less. So uh, there has been a huge uh, development in the field of imaging. The anesthesia is a crucial part of liver surgery. Uh, then intraoperative ultrasound, it came into picture, which was introduced by Makuchi from Japan to see where the tumor is, where the vascular structures are, to locate it at the time of surgery. And then a lot of gadgets of dividing the liver or parenchymal transaction, navigation system, image guidance, laparoscopic and, and robotic surgery came into picture. And since last 50 years, the first transplant was done in 1967. Since then, there are a lot of innovations in the field of uh, liver transplantation and that has made uh, more experience in the, in the field of liver surgery and, and, and more and more difficult cancer surgery has become common now because of this training. 
and furthermore a portal of embolization alves icg guidance all this came into picture and there are has been a lot of development in the field of liver surgery so if you see uh, these patients who undergo this major operations uh, it is important to understand that liver is the organ which regenerates this is the only organ which regenerates if you remove part of the liver liver regenerates so in a normal person if you remove uh, uh, about 70% of the liver the 30% of the liver a person can survive so liver has a tremendous capacity to regenerate the journey began more than 150 years before where a lot of attempts were made to do liver surgery and and slowly uh, the first successful liver resection was done in 1911 uh in the france and there has been a lot of uh, excitement lot of other techniques were developed to to divide the liver first uh, uh the finger fracture method was introduced in 1950s by a taiwan surgeon and then lot of gadgets came into 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 market and there are uh, many scientists who who invented uh, and found out uh, the difficult anatomy of the liver starting from glisson who introduced glisson's capsule and then clonard who introduced clonard classification and then and so on and so forth so uh, this 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 knowledge of anatomy in case of liver is very very important and this has made uh, uh, a nomenclature for for liver resection and that was introduced in 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 2000 that's called ihpb a brisbane classification for segmented anatomy of the liver and then a lot of more innovation in form of ultrasound guided dye injection which was introduced by makuchi glissonian pedicle approach uh total vascular exclusion ex situ liver resection anterior approach hanging maneuvers so all this development happened uh, in last 30 40 years and that has made a lot of huge change uh, in the field of liver surgery the icg clearance test uh, which was uh, which is mainly used in the in the eastern countries was introduced by makuchi uh, to make the liver surgery and resection safe and he introduced this icg retention at 15 minutes Uh, which was used as a criteria as a, as a makuchi criteria for liver resection so that was introduced and it is mainly used in the in the eastern countries so and and furthermore the newer concepts are to preserve the liver parenchyma so as far as liver we have to preserve if we are doing a, a surgery uh, for for liver cancer and the transfusion rate after liver surgery has decreased we know what's the anatomy how to mobilize the liver we use intraoperative ultrasound pringle maneuver and there was this all this has made liver surgery safe most of the patients they stay in hospital for five or seven days one day in icu and the overall mortality after liver surgery has drastically come out and and the blood loss at the time of surgery has drastically gone down so this was a major cause of of mortality in the in the previous years so it is important to understand how is the liver whether the liver is normal whether the liver is cirrhotic or whether the liver is cholestatic because of chemotherapy or cholestatic because of the obstruction and and that is imp- important when we plan a surgery this is bit uh, something beyond uh, your interest for for the undergraduate but this is just give you an idea what i am trying to say if somebody is wants to pursue his, his career in liver surgery this will just give a broad idea what is happening around the world so so the resection is performed mainly for hepatocellular carcinoma cholangiocarcinoma or metastatic liver disease or benign conditions the hcc that's hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common cancer that we see in this part of the world and is one of the co- most common cancer related death uh, around the world and most of the patient who will have hepatocellular carcinoma will have cirrhosis in the background so this makes surgery difficult and if you try and resect these patients they develop post operative liver failure bleeding and lot of complications and then there are lot of treatment options for hcc like transplant resection and and ablative therapies to cure uh, this cancer regarding resection this is the main stage of treatment if the person has a normal liver surgery gives the best result but if if the person is having a chronic liver disease like cirrhosis if we try and resect this patient they will develop liver failure and bleeding so that that criteria of of, of indication is very very important it has to be an early stage cancer with good liver function good liver remaining behind because the remaining liver will grow as i said if you remove half liver the liver the remaining liver will grow in two months so it is very important that a person should have uh, adequate liver remaining behind he should not have Uh, adic- uh, significant portal hypertension and and depending on the expertise uh, the the surgery is offered the the person who has an advanced disease or extra hepatic disease or uh, uh, progressive 
uh, deteriorating liver function or bile duct involvement are not good candidates for surgery. When we do resection, there has to be at least one centimeter margin and, and good liver remaining behind. Normally, it has to be an anatomical resection rather than non-anatomical resection because the anatomical resection, uh, if we do uh, the chances of recurrence after liver resection uh, will be will be lower compared to non-anatomical resection. And all these patients, they need a thorough investigation preoperatively uh, to plan the surgery. And it is important to understand that, as I said, liver is a volume game. We should know uh, what's, the, what's the anatomy in the liver, uh, what is the exact volume of the liver. We do this preoperatively uh, with a test called a volumetry test. So this is a CT scan which is done preoperatively. We know how much uh, the size of the liver is, how much the, the right lobe and the left lobe preoperatively. And there are a lot of computer-assisted models are available in the market now that can reconstruct image of liver, image of biliary tree, vascular structure preoperatively, like Mavis software from, from uh, Germany. So all these models are used during surgery and it will give a real-time intraoperative guidance during liver resection and these are slowly coming in, coming into a market where you can reconstruct the whole image of the liver preoperatively you know exactly where the tumor is how much you are going to resect how much liver is going to remain behind and that can be virtually seen uh, intraoperatively with this navigation system and also what is nowadays used is the icg imaging that is the dye is injected a uh, few minutes earlier and and the tumor is visualized on table because ICG will take up the tumor and if it is not seen otherwise it can be picked up at the time of surgery. This is mainly useful in, in laparoscopic surgery where you cannot actually feel the tumor and you can see here the tumor is uh, uh, well delineated and it can be resected at the time of surgery. Regarding metastatic disease, the most common surgery that we perform is the metastasis from colorectal cancer. It is the most uh, common cancer that is that is operated for, for metastatic disease. So uh, the patient who has colorectal cancer who present with resectable liver metastasis, if you resect them, the overall uh, the survival improves, provided we do R0 resection, means we remove all the tumor, the remaining liver is good, and there is no extra hepatic disease. If we resect this patient, they will do, they will do well. It is important to understand that this, this patient will have a post-chemotherapy liver and we might have to do certain maneuver uh, to make sure that they don't develop a post-operative uh, liver failure. So the liver will look like this. It's called post-chemotherapy liver. So it's a congested liver. Uh, this is oxaliplatin-induced liver resection, a liver injury. And in selected patients, uh, we try to manipulate volume of the liver with a technique called portloven embolization. This is a very exciting area of liver surgery where if you are trying to reset all this tumor, the remaining liver will be very small and those patients will develop a liver failure post-operatively. So if we do embolization of the portal vein on one side, that the opposite side liver will, will hypertrophy and that will be safer for patient to undergo a major resection. So this is called a portal vein embolization, which takes three to four weeks to hypertrophy and then you go in and resect. So this technique is performed percutaneously. The portal vein is embolized and as I have shown here, uh, the, the liver which has hypertrophy on the left side, the right side is resected. So uh, if you see here, the congested area is the embolized area and you can see the left side of the liver has hypertrophied. So this is how uh, the area of the liver can be hypertrophied preoperatively when we are planning uh, to resect this patient. And you can see here a hypertrophy left above the liver. So uh, this is an important maneuver, particularly for the patients who, who undergo colorectal liver metastasis. So here we try to do a non-anatomical resection, try and preserve as much as liver as possible doing a wedge resection like this and remove all the metastatic disease. This is called a non-anatomical resection. You can see there is no need to go for right hepatectomy or a left hepatectomy. And this is called uh, a non-anatomical resection. And anatomical resection means you do either a right hepatectomy or a left hepatectomy and do a small uh, 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 metastatectomy on the, on the remaining side. So this is called an anatomical resection for, for colorectal liver metastasis. Even if you do a resection which is closer to the vessels for such patients, even that will give a better survival. So what I'm trying to say is that patients who have metastatic disease for colorectal cancer, uh, if you try and dissect these patients, uh, even if they have uh, multicentric disease, they can have a lot of uh, uh, interventions like portal vein embolization, uh, R1 resection, 
and the overall chances of of, of survival will will improve in this patient so this patient had a tumor which was close to the portal vein branch and it was resected uh, reconstructing uh, the the branch of the portal vein so similarly this patient had a multiple liver tumor you can see this mri shows multiple liver tumor this lady was operated for colon cancer and had multiple tumors so when we resected this lady we did an mri and then we you can see there are one two three four five so many tumors in the liver so all these tumors were resected with the help of intraoperative ultrasound this is called intraoperative ultrasound we do sonography on table putting the probe on the liver and you can see the metastasis the tumor is located in the liver can you see that's a tumor so it is located with the help of ultrasonic probe and then that portion of the liver is resected that is called ultrasound guided metastatectomy so you can see what the gadget i am using is a kuza which is used to 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 cut the liver so this is the kuza machine that we use and you can see the metastasis of the liver is resected you can see that is a tumor in the liver that was seen on the mri so this is one tumor and then again we can put the probe of the sonography machine and confirm that we have removed the same portion because we are digging it so all this metastasis can be separately resected and the liver can be you know subjected to ultrasound and find any occult metastasis and you can see all the metastasis were removed in this lady there were five metastases so when we did a pathology examination all of them had a viable tumor so this is how a metastatic resection for the a uh, colon uh, cancer uh, which has metastasis liver is performed so the basic principles are proper exposure of the abdomen to find out uh, i mean uh, for the liver and intraoperative ultrasound control of inflow outflow preserve biliary tree parenchymal transection control of bleeding low cvp and drainage the basic maneuvers i am just uh, quickly going to describe is one is that we should uh, have an adequate exposure usually we put a j incision like this you know or it can be a mercedes benz incision where uh, a proper exposure of the liver is done so this is the normal incision that we put but it can be a mercedes benz incision or it can be a midline incision and this is how once we put this incision the whole liver will be seen in front of you and then you decide what what you want to do which type of operation you are performing and then mobilization the the ligament structure of the liver there's a life and the the left coronary ligament and triangular ligament of the liver are exposed you can see the falciform ligament is divided and then the right and the left coronary uh, ligaments are divided the whole liver is mobilized depending on where the tumor is uh, we have to mobilize the liver so the liver is mobilized and then the proper exposure is very very important for this we need a proper retractor system do good good cotry machine and a good assistant to assist you to mobilize and once you mobilize the liver the liver will be in your hand and you can do uh the resection that you that you that you want to perform so this is how the mobilization is done and the other important aspect is a pringle maneuver because liver has a inflow of artery and vein a hepatic artery and portal vein so if we are planning a resection we need to control this and that is called a pringle maneuver so when we are doing a resection we try and snug this area so that when we transect the liver uh, there is no bleeding so you can see the umbilical tape is passed in uh, from uh, this this is the pedicles uh, of the liver and you can see this area uh, is uh, you know uh, an umbilical tape is used for this maneuver this is called pringle maneuver so once we snug this the inflow will be blocked so when we transect the liver uh, there will be no uh, bleeding and depending on what we are resecting we can have isolated vascular uh, occlusion depending on what we are resecting suppose if you are if you want to clamp the right branch of the portal vein and right hepatic artery if we if we clamp it on one side we can see a line of demarcation can you see this is a line of demarcation on the liver surface so if we clamp the left side of pedicle the left side of the liver will become congested and then we know you can see the tumor on the left side so the left side will become congested and we will resect the left side of the liver so this is called a vascular exclusion the cvp has to be low the central venous pressure is is kept low because if the cvp is high these patients with they develop uh, bleeding so you can see the the, the inferior vena cava this is called ivc uh, is it should not be very tight otherwise uh, there is a bleeding from that area the the most important part of liver surgery is intraoperative sonography there are different probes available and these are the probes that we use at the time of surgery uh, putting probe directly onto the liver and find out where the tumor is located uh feel it with the finger and then uh, put the probe on the on the liver 
uh, see where the tumor is and then dig that area. You can see there is a tumor there that is seen uh, intraoperatively, uh, which was seen on CT scan, and that area was marked, and then the tumor is is resected. So this is uh, intraoperative sonography, uh, which is which is used to resect this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, metastatic tumor. So you can see the, the metastasis from the liver was resected. So uh, this intraoperative ultrasonography will pick up smaller lesion like this. You know, if there are smaller tumor can be picked up at the time of surgery and you can do a radiofrequency ablation or a microwave ablation or a cryo ablation at the time of surgery. Uh, there are a lot of gadgets to divide the liver. Uh, the finger fracture method, ultrasonic, water jet, harmonic, there are lots and lots of gadgets now. Uh, this is the old method of uh, parenchymal transection. You can see one artery forcep, which is there, which is dividing the, the parenchyma of the liver. And this is a very nice method. And still many centers uh, are using this. This is called a Kelly lysis. Just use an artery forcep, just crush the, uh, the parenchyma of the liver. The pedicles will get separated and you can, you know, apply a clip or a ligature and, and then you go ahead. The, the most uh, the widely used instrument nowadays is this, and that is called Kusa, that is called ultrasonic aspirator. So uh, this is the machine that that's the most of the uh, liver centers they use uh, to divide the liver. You can see the liver has uh, opened up like a book, the right lobe and the left lobe, and this is the machine uh, which is used to to divide the, uh, the the liver parenchyma. The other gadgets are harmonic scalpel, a focus device, uh, which is used for parenchymal transaction. And this is available in the most of the centers. This is a hand probe called focus probe, which is used uh, to divide the, the parenchymal uh, uh, structure. The other, other important thing is uh, a ligature. This is also uh, a widely available instrument and it is also used particularly for the, uh, the tumors which are, which are periphery located. And once we, we resect the liver, we have to see for the bile leak because if there are small bile ducts which are open, it will call cause a collection in that area, Will patient will develop sepsis. So we inject methylene blue, try and see if there is any leak. And if there is any leak, we try to fix it on the table. And once we finish the operation, we have to fix the liver, which we have mobilized. If we don't fix the liver, the liver may rotate on one side or flip on one side, and the venous drainage of the liver may get hampered and, and may give ischemia. So liver needs to be fixed to the anterior abdominal wall. You can see it came into its physiological uh, position and then there should not be any issue with the venous drainage. Lymphadenectomy is an important part after resection and there are huge uh, amount of uh, maneuver uh, which are, which are uh, there like just like uh, hanging maneuver. This was described by Belgetti for, for larger tumors. Uh, sling is passed in, in front of the IVC and these tumors are resected and also a total vascular exclusion the inferior vena cava is clamped, the porta hepatitis is clamped, and the tumor which are close to the inferior vena cava are resected. For example, uh, this is the liver, this is right hepatic vein, this is middle, and this is left hepatic vein, and this is the IVC. If the tumor is located here, if you try and resect this area, there is going to be a lot of bleeding. So in such patient, you can see there is a tumor here. Can you see it is close to the IVC? If we try and resect this tumor, there is going to be a bleeding. You can see this is intraoperative sonography which is performed, and you can see the tumor is right there at the left hepatic vein and inferior vena cava. So this is the dissected inferior vena cava. You can see that is the right hepatic vein. And we have done a clamping of porta. The IVC was clamped at the bottom end and the IVC was clamped above. So, so this is called a total vascular exclusion. So uh, this is a very nice technique where a, a huge tumor is uh, involving IVC. So after transaction, a large clamp is applied uh, in the superior aspect and the whole liver is excluded from the circulation. So th then we can resect the tumor and, and ligate the, uh, uh, the vein there. So you can see this is a uh, Pringle maneuver and the, uh, the inferior vena cava was clamped and you can see superiorly also suprahepatic vena cava was also clamped and that's the tumor in the left lobe of the liver. There was a tumor and that's the clamp which is applied. So now uh, the whole tumor is resected uh, with the clamp in place. So at this time, the anesthetist has to be very, very careful. And uh, here we, we have to make sure that the anesthetists are trained because there is going to be a lot of hemodynamic instability. So you can see now the tumor is resected. So this is called a total vascular exclusion. 
where tumor is very close to the inferior vena cava and you can see the tumor is resected and that is the portion of the uh, ivc which was reconstructed and the large clamp is is removed so that is the inferior vena cava the pringle and the ivc clamps are released now and you can see that is the ivc so tumor which is close to inferior vena cava are dealt with doing uh, this maneuver call a total vascular exclusion and there are a lot of uh, innovative techniques like glissonian pedicle approach where the artery vein bile ducts are not separated but the whole sheath the glissonian sheath is taken at the at the hilum that's called glissonian sheath approach where uh, the whole sheath is isolated right uh, right at the hilum so you can see this is the hilum of the liver where uh, the the dissection is performed and the uh, sling is passed so this is the right side of the pedicle so whole right side of the liver is isolated by passing this pedicle this is called a glissonian pedicle approach so and then we again do uh, right anterior and right posterior uh, clamping so you can see the right side we have done right anterior and right posterior clamping so by doing this method we can do right anterior sectionectomy or right posterior sectionectomy so once we clamp this area that that portion of the liver will get congested so here this uh, this young girl had a tumor in the segment 6 and 7 so you can see i am applying a clamp there so once i apply this clamp the area of that portion of the liver will get congested you can see now you can see this congested area of the liver this is called segment 6 and segment 7 so this is isolated clamping of that area of the liver and then this area of the liver can be actually marked uh, with the help of diathermy and it can be uh, resected so there has been a lot of innovative techniques which are used nowadays uh, the laparoscopic surgery is also done in many centers we have also started laparoscopic surgery for liver and uh, as you can see from mercedes benz incision to l incision to j incision to a midline incision and now a smaller incision laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery is also uh, in 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 many centers now for for resection but mainly it is done for the tumors Uh, which are uh, periphery located but also in a specialized center they perform a major hyperectomy when uh, uh, they are they have a trained team we need to have a proper gadgets intraoperative ultrasound uh, flexible scope uh, 3d vision etc uh, to house this program and 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 it is also one of the successful uh, uh, technique of doing liver surgery there has been a societies and consensus conference on laparoscopic liver resection and they have laid down uh, difficulty scoring criteria for the surgeons who are learning laparoscopic liver surgery uh, to start with a smaller resection first and then progress to uh, larger resection so this is a upcoming area where uh, a laparoscopic liver surgery is coming this is a small tumor in the liver that we have resected i am showing a small video here you can see this patient had a metastasis from a uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumor uh, on the surface of the liver which was resected laparoscopically can you see this small scar so this patient can go home next day or in a day or two they don't require a uh, major open uh, surgery similarly uh, this patient you can see there was a uh, 3.5 cm tumor in segment 6 which was uh, resected with the help of laparoscopy so this is uh, so uh, can you see this is a uh, cuza this is laparoscopic cuza and you can see the liver is transected with this uh, this machine uh, called ultrasound aspirator and the liver uh, parenchyma transection is in progress and at the end of the surgery you can see the tumor is resected so this was a laparoscopic surgery where a portion of the liver was resected can you see this liver is resected now so this tumor was resected and you can see uh, at the end of the surgery you can see a good margin so this this patient they go home in two or three days without a large incision similarly another tumor which was very close to the gallbladder can you see this tumor was very close to the gallbladder and you can see this is a very large fatty liver and this is the area of the tumor here and uh, this gentleman had a laparoscopic resection so you can see it is on the gallbladder bed but it was hepatocellular carcinoma and it was resected the whole area of the liver was resected laparoscopically so previously such operations were done uh, with open but selected cases uh, uh, are done laparoscopically nowadays so you can see uh, the area of the liver which was resected and this is the the area of the transected surface uh, on the liver 
that's the, the gallbladder was also removed and that is the tumor which was resected so this surgery can be now performed laparoscopically and even 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 uh, even robotically so it is now feasible and there are many centers who are uh, performing such operations and laparoscopically you can see this is a specimen the tumor so this patient will have a smaller incision uh, uh, they go home in 2 to 3 days uh, the recovery is is very very fast so similarly uh, robotic surgery in a specialized center where do they have a robo can be performed robotically the only issue with robotic surgery is that it does not have a kusa machine so the transaction of the liver is usually done with the help of harmonic scalpel and it has got all the movements that you want at the time of surgery uh, but there is no tactile sensation in just like in laparoscopy because you are sitting on a machine and your assistant is there on the other side so it becomes become difficult but now many centers have trained people uh, they even do donor hepatectomy uh, robotically the problem is the cost it requires a learning curve and uh, still i as i said doesn't have uh, a kusa machine and uh, according to the literature there is no much advantage over over laparoscopic surgery so so most of the centers they still do uh, laparoscopic surgery they use a 3d vision because in in in, in robotic surgery there is a 3d vision so if you are having uh, laparoscopic instruments and laparoscopic cart which is 3d uh, i think it is enough to perform uh, uh, laparoscopic liver surgery so uh, this is a bit last uh, portion of my talk where i'm going to talk about a new innovation that's called alps associating liver partition and portal vein ligation for stage hepatectomy so as i was describing portal vein embolization where uh, we can increase the size of the liver so people have realized that if we ligate the portal vein and if we divide the liver liver regenerates so this is a very upcoming area uh, in the field of liver surgery uh, where a future liver laminate is small suppose there is a huge mass or a multiple liver tumors and remaining liver is very small those patient will develop a liver failure and those patient will need something to increase the liver volume so the, this technique is performed and uh, the advantage is that we can do arterial resection but it uh, has a higher mortality and this procedure was introduced in uh, 2007 and uh, this was the first publication uh, in 2012 by the german uh, people and they realized that if you like get the portal vein and we if we transect the liver and if we go inside after a month after a week and they can see hypertrophy so uh, the first step is to do a liver transection and portal vein ligation and then uh, you isolate all the pedicle and after 7 to 9 days if you go inside the liver regenerates so it is you can see here this patient had a multiple tumor on the right side but the left liver is very small so if we remove the right liver this patient will develop liver failure so in the first step what is done is the portal vein is ligated and liver is divided as shown in b figure so portal vein is ligated and divided and liver is transected but the liver on the right side is not removed but after uh, 7 to 8 days uh, this is the picture after first surgery the liver is kept in a bag and all the structures are sling but the tumor and liver is not removed and after about a week or so again ct scan is done the left liver will increase in size dramatically so a fast a hypertrophy of the liver will occur and then the final step is done you can see this area of the liver a small liver which was otherwise there but if you do alps the liver remnant will increase in size as you can see in figure b and then you go inside and remove the tumor on the right side so this is a second step you can see the yellow area is a tumor the right lobe will be removed and the flr means future liver remnant this lobe has increased in size so if you remove the right side of the liver this left side of the liver is quite adequate for this patient and this patient will not develop liver failure so this is an exciting area of of liver surgery and now a uh, uh, few centers are performing this this procedure has a lot of uh, morbidity involved uh, not done everywhere mainly it is done for patients who have Uh, colorectal liver metastasis but also in in few patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma and very rarely for for hyaluronic cholangiocarcinoma and this is the international alps registry uh, www.alps.net where you can find all the data related to alps so this is a very uh, exciting area uh, of liver surgery uh, where where they have an advanced 
set up uh, specialized set up they they perform the surgery so to summarize i would say that there has been a tremendous uh, progress in the field of liver surgery in last 40 to 50 years there has been a lot of technical advances and rapid improvement in the patient safety liver surgery has become safe in the near future liver surgery will become more precise less invasive due to uh, substantial progress in the development in the field of navigation surgery uh, progress in the field of cancer imaging and also uh, minimal access surgery uh, as uh, bavika was telling uh, we do liver update every year we started in 2009 and so far we have done more than probably 11 liver updates uh, this was uh, 2019 that we did for innovative techniques we had Uh, hosted an hpb core cells as well uh, we are doing one liver update uh, next month also uh, that is liver update 2020 we are having a dnb super specialty gi surgery program at sterling uh, where they do uh, super specialty gi surgery we have residents from all over india now uh, for for this specialized training we have a very active liver unit i invite if anyone is interested to see uh any complex surgery uh, they can talk to me and they can visit our theater with permission and uh, these are our this is our website and we also have a trust to help poor patients who have have liver cancer that's called liver cancer trust amdabad uh hosted by our family members and and we try to help uh, particularly the pediatric patients who are suffering from from liver cancer thank you I, if i have some time i can show you a small video uh you have time yes sir we have uh, 15 minutes if you want simultaneous call on am i am, is my voice audible Yes, sir. It's audible. Yeah, so I'll run it. Yeah. Uh, you are not able to see my screen no sir okay i'll i'll do the screen share Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. We can see. Can you see my screen now? Yes. And there was a large Can can you see my screen? So the screen sharing is stopped. We okay. can't see the no. screen. I'll start the screen sharing. Just let yeah. me know if you. Yes, sir. Can you see the screen sharing now? Can yes, sir. It? Yes, sir. We can okay. see. So I'm showing you a huge liver tumor. Can you can you can you hear my voice? 
Yes, sir. So there was a large tumor in the liver. Can you see? This is a CT scan, and there was a very large tumor in the liver. And this tumor was very difficult to resect. So this gentleman, you can see a huge tumor in the right lobe. This was a hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, he came to us for surgery, and uh, we decided to resect it. So you can see once we opened up, there was a very large tumor. It was very difficult to mobilize. So here we have used an approach called an anterior approach, where without mobilizing the right lobe of the liver, we have resected this tumor. This is a very uh, advanced surgery and very difficult operation. You can see we have dissected the hilar area. We have uh, isolated the portal vein. You can see this is the portal vein on the right side, and then we did intraoperative sonography, and then. We we ligated the right hepatic artery on the right side, so you can see the liver has opened up like a book here. Can you see? We have transected the liver, and liver is open like a book. The right lobe is there with a tumor, and the left lobe is without tumor. So uh, this is called an anterior approach, where a large tumor. Can you see a huge tumor on the right side? So slowly the whole area was mobilized, and then we reached in that area. We reached up to the. a uh, right hepatic artery a uh, right hepatic vein that is a right hepatic vein and after transection we divided the right hepatic vein so once we do that the whole tumor will come out so can you see a huge tumor which was resected this is called a right hepatectomy uh, with anterior approach and this is the liver which remains behind uh, after the resection so this is the inferior vena cava this is the area where the tumor was and and that's the that's the remaining liver so this is how uh, major liver surgery is performed and this operation takes about 7 uh, to 8 hours so it's a, a major surgery so i think uh, uh, we can take uh, questions now uh, so we have a few questions from the delegates the first question is uh, yes. that how is the experience of this gastro uh, enteric or the liver surgery is different than other surgical branches see liver surgery is a very specialized surgery uh because now uh, there are courses where you can do uh, liver surgery training you can do liver transplant training and a uh, person can become a liver surgeon or a liver transplant surgeon normally transplant surgeons they perform liver surgery also so this has become a specialized area where they can do uh, only liver surgery training where transplant and liver surgery is there uh, they can also do hepatobiliary surgery training where they do tackle uh, liver cases as well as pancreas and other cases but it can be a non transplant uh, area so it depends on what a person is uh, interested uh, uh, normally uh, when we were uh, you know going through this phase there was no specialized branch at that time only surgical gastroenterology was there was no hepatobiliary surgery or transplant so but now a person when is passing ms exam uh, they can have a special uh, place where they can have training in hepatobiliary surgery or transplant and they can straight away become Uh, hepatobiliary or transplant surgeon so that, that is possible now but otherwise uh, they do uh, mch or dnb surgical gastroenterology and then they take up uh, transplant or hepatobiliary sir another question in your experience is the surgical sector different in india as compared to the western countries uh no it is very good uh, i think uh, experience wise and volume wise uh, india is far ahead Uh, the only thing is that we don't have a structured referred uh, this thing so uh, in western countries they have a uh, specialized centers where all the uh, those particular problem patient will get referred to in india we still don't have that so but still uh, there are centers and there are places where uh, lot of good experience huge volume is still there so uh, it is good in india as well so one more question uh, we described in your intro that you started with the cadaveric liver transplantation are there any particular uh, risks while doing this or any particular uh, precaution that you need to take post surgery when you are doing a cadaveric liver transplantation see uh, i have not covered transplant area because it becomes too much 
uh, for uh, this level. So I have intentionally not included transplant. Transplants are of two types. One is living donor liver transplant and another is cadaveric liver transplant. Living donor liver transplant means a family member will donate half liver for his loved ones. And cadaveric liver transplant means a brain dead person will donate all other organs like kidney, liver, pancreas, and then uh, the organs are retrieved and then harvested and then implanted. So uh, these are the two types. After transplant, uh, I mean, the risk of transplant is about 5%. Uh, so any person who is undergoing transplant, the risk is about 5% in most of the centers. And post-operatively, they have to take precaution. They have to take medicine lifelong and do regular checking. Uh, so that is there. But most of the patients who tolerate procedure will, will usually do well. And the overall results of transplants are quite good compared to previous years. Thank you, sir, again for speaking to us and introducing us to this exciting world of liver surgery. Uh, I'd now request Anjali please to please take over the session. And again, thank you, sir, for being part of AMCON. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Navika. Our final keynote speaker is Dr. Sanjeev Ratnakar Fatak. He is affiliated with Oxford Diabetes Center, Steno Diabetes Center, and Jocelyn's Diabetes Center. He is a practicing diabetologist and physician at Vijayaratna Diabetes Diagnosis and Treatment Center and Thakashi Charitable Trust Hospital. He is the principal investigator in over 30 global clinical trials, including the new CVOT trials. He has been invited as guest faculty at various national and international level of conference, including SAARC, RSSDI, APICON, Diabetes India, and CID. He has several publications as first author and co-author, including publications in Diabetes Care, International Journal of Diabetes in Developing Countries, Journal of Clinical Diabetology, and JAPI. He was the recipient of Sanofi Lectureship Award at APICON in 2016 and a life member of APA, API, RSSDI, IDF, ADA, and AACE. He is also the ex-president of Association of Physicians of Ahmedabad and the current director of Juvenile Diabetes Association Ahmedabad. He was the first diabetologist in India to start insulin pump therapy. He has developed and published unique diabetes motivational health score in the year 2018. Uh, if you have any questions during this session, please write them in the chat box. And now, please welcome Dr. Sanjeev Fatak. Good evening. Thank you, Anjali, for your very generous introduction. And uh, Anjali being as good as my daughter, or rather I can say I as bad as my daughter. Uh, thank you, Dhruvam. Thank you, the MCON team, for giving me an opportunity to share my views about managing a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patient. Anjali, may I have the uh, opportunity to share my screen? So can I share my screen now? Yeah, please go ahead. So, so is my screen visible now? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'll be talking about how to manage newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patient, right? Uh, managing a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patient is as complex as you see on the right side of the slide, the complexity which is involved in this. Uh, meaning thereby that it is not now in the world of so many medications so easy to manage type 2 diabetes unless you have understood it very well. And that's what I'm going to do in next 30-45 minutes. Well, uh, my uh, presentation will comprise of some important cases which are not very how to manage them in the practice and what do the guidelines say and then uh, the blue index which we published uh, a couple of years ago i'll be just uh, touching upon that one important aspect i'll be touching upon is the reversal of diabetes is it possible and finally in the covid era how does management of diabetes change? That we will discuss in uh, final slides. So all the pictures I will show in this presentation are imaginary. Any resemblance to any character, living or dead, is purely coincidental. So 
Okay, it's bad. So I'll start with case number one. A 40-year-old male comes to you with fasting blood glucose of 120. He is not having any symptoms. He is asymptomatic. His father had diabetes and he had died at a young age of 65 of myocardial infarction. I say 65 is young because these days people live quite long. His weight is 95 kg, which according to his height, his BMI becomes about 30. So how will you manage? Uh, can anyone have the answer in the chat box? I'll wait for 30 seconds and then I'll proceed. So what diagnosis do we have for him? Does he have diabetes? How many say yes? How many say no? And how many say that can't say right now? So what are the diagnostic criteria for diabetes? Well, we'll close the poll and we'll look at the chat box later on. Well, according to the American Diabetes Association 1997 and WHO 1999, the criteria have been almost same thereafter, which means if fasting is more than 126, fasting means fasting for eight hours and that is overnight fasting or casual plasma glucose or what we call popularly RBS more than 200 milligram in presence of symptoms or over post glucose not post meals because meal cannot be standardized someone may be eating three rotis someone may be eating five rotis so meal cannot be standardized so it is two hour post 75 gram glucose more than 200 so any of this criteria if patient has he is classified to have diabetes and this is true for type 1 as well as type 2. But in type 1, you don't require this criteria because type 1 diabetics present with very high sugar straight away. I'm not going to discuss about type 1 diabetes today. We are going to discuss about mainly type 2 because in our Indian population, 95% of the diabetes is type 2 diabetes. So coming back to this case, what other investigations are required? Well, fasting was 120. According to the AD or WHO criteria, more than 126 is diabetes, less than 100 is normal. So he falls between normal and abnormal. So you can say from fasting, he has pre-diabetes or impaired fasting glucose. And that is why we will require either an oral glucose tolerance test or an HbA1c, right? So whether HbA1c is having any diagnostic value? Five years back, HbA1c was not considered in the diagnosis of diabetes. But of late, the guidelines have been revised and have included HbA1c also in the diagnosis of diabetes. So if HbA1c is less than 5.7, it is normal. 5.8 to 6.4, it is pre-diabetes or a person at risk of developing diabetes. And more than 6.5 or 6.5 itself both inclusive, is diabetes. So we need to get his HbA1c done to know whether he is having diabetes or not. Suppose his HbA1c is 6.2, then we would classify him to be having pre-diabetes. But the important message is that, that in spite of being pre-diabetic, he is at risk of developing cardiovascular disease because he is overweight, he is having strong family history of coronary artery disease and that is why we need to treat him as aggressively as we would do in a diabetes patient. We need to control his blood pressure, we need to control his lipids and we also need to look at his uric acid and SGPT. Dr. Hitesh Chowda in his presentation might have referred to fatty liver disease as one of the important liver diseases these days and the commonest cause of fatty liver disease is metabolic syndrome or diabetes itself. Even for cirrhosis, alcohol has become the second most important cause, the highest incidence of, uh, rather the highest prevalence of uh, fatty liver disease is found in patients or cirrhosis also is found in patients with obesity or type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. An ECG may also be required or a TMT and coronary calcium to rule out whether he is having asymptomatic cardiovascular disease. We will not discuss about that here. 
let us have a look at what is metabolic syndrome so metabolic syndrome is defined as central obesity or waist circumference more than 90 cm in males or 85 cm in females hypertension that is systolic more than 140 and diastolic more than 90 ifg igt or diabetes so not necessarily diabetes even if patient with pre diabetes if he is obese he is having hypertension then he fits into the criteria of metabolic syndrome and dyslipidemia in the form of high triglyceride more than 150 or hdl less than 35 for our indian patients sometimes ldl may not be that high we are having atherogenic dyslipidemia. We are thin fat Indians, which means even at low BMI, we are having more visceral fat. And that is why we are having more insulin resistance. And that's why treating our Indian patients aggressively early on is the key to prevent the late diabetes complications. So the message from the first case is that even if he is pre-diabetic, we need to emphasize on diet, exercise and if required pharmacotherapy also because now we know that metformin and some other drugs are also recommended even at the pre-diabetes level we'll move on to the case number two 50 year old gentleman recently diagnosed to have diabetes his weight is 85 his bmi is 30 again his fasting is 145 his post is 230 and his HbA1c is 7. Sorry. The doctor advised him diet and exercise and no need to start OED and asked for no further tests. Doctor told him that abhi chalega, abhi diet or exercise karo, teen char mahine ke baad dekhenge and then if required, we'll go for the uh, medical therapy or pharmacotherapy. Was he right? Well, 15 years ago, this were the guidelines that start with diet and exercise. If target is not achieved, then you start the therapy. But over a period of time, all the international studies have shown that it is a failure based approach and that should not be acceptable because what happens with that, that patient lands up into multiple complications later on because you have not treated the disease early on. This patient, since he was not treated, got hospitalized with heart attack six months later. Could this have been prevented? Yes, definitely. Had we started treatment early on, not only diabetes treatment, but the other things also, probably this could have been prevented. So let us come back to this case. His BMI is 30. His blood pressure is 145.95. He is a smoker. So now, how will you manage? So I'll give you one minute rather half a minute and you can uh, put in the chat box that what treatment will you suggest to this patient his HbA1c is 7 okay well the common answer may be diet exercise and oral anti-diabetic monotherapy, right? But before that, we must find out what are other abnormalities because as we discussed earlier, that type 2 diabetes is as a result of insulin resistance. And this patient may have abnormality of the lipids. He may have elevated creatinine and we must calculate the GFR also because according to the United Kingdom prospective diabetes study, which was done about 20 years back, had shown that even at the time of diagnosis, about 25% of our patients do have renal complication or diabetic nephropathy, which is undetected. And unless you go for creatinine and urine microalbumin test, you may not be able to detect this. And if not detected in time, it may lead to renal failure and more importantly cardiovascular problem any patient with renal problem is at more risk of dying due to the cardiac cause rather than renal cause itself moreover as we discussed patient should also be advised to undergo an sgpt test with a simple blood test hemoglobin obviously will be required a baseline ecg resting ecg is also uh, necessary 
and at the same time the retinal examination because 15 to 20 percent of our diabetic patient again at diagnosis have diabetic retinopathy also the reason being that in our country diabetes is detected quite late and that's why number of times type 2 diabetic patients come to us with multiple complications they were never knowing that they were having diabetes unless they come to know after they have some visual problem or their creatine is elevated or they develop some cardiac problem so coming back again to this case what are the treatment options of course one option which was correct maybe 15 20 years back was only lifestyle changes total lifestyle changes that is diet exercise and avoidance of stress avoidance of smoking and all that is in the lifestyle changes but we now know that it is not sufficient and that is why the guidelines now recommend to start with metformin right at the time of diagnosis along with diet and exercise but in the next few slides i'll show you that why still guidelines recommend only metformin which actually is not appropriate for our indian asian patients and we should go for lifestyle plus oral combination therapy straight away and what else apart from diet exercise oral therapy of anti diabetic drugs anything else is required we'll discuss over a bit of time there are different guidelines for managing or guiding you regarding the management of type 2 diabetes american diabetes association guidelines jocelyn guidelines idf guidelines easd guidelines and our own research society of study in Di diabetes in india rssdi guidelines amongst all these guidelines the american diabetes association guidelines are accepted mostly across the world what do they say this is 2020 guidance of ada which shows that diabetic patients are at high cardiovascular risk and if they are having high cardiovascular risk or having cardiovascular disease already established we should consider agents with cardiovascular disease benefit independently of the baseline hb1c so the first line therapy will be metformin along with comprehensive lifestyle changes but if patient is having high cardiovascular risk or is having established cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney diseases or heart failure we should also add along with metformin either an sglt2 inhibitor which are new class of agents or a glp1 analog we'll discuss what are they in subsequent slides if patient has atherosclerotic vascular disease glp1 with proven benefits are preferable if patient has heart failure or ckd then sglt2 is preferable if one class is not tolerated or is not adequate then the other class can be added on the other hand if patient does not have any established cardiovascular or renal disease and if the hb1c is above normal after 3 months of metformin therapy we have option of adding a dpp4 inhibitor or a glp1 analog or an sglt2 inhibitor or a pioglitazone that is thiazolidones if patient comes to you with significantly high blood sugar then obviously the option of insulin is always there in our country when cost is a major issue we can even consider sulfonylurea or pioglitazone which are cheaper drugs but now fortunately the dpp4 inhibitors and the sglt2 inhibitors have also become cheap so as we can give the benefit of this uh, important therapies to our non affording patients also some of the agents promote weight some of the agents cause weight loss and for that glp1 analog and sglt2 they cause weight loss which is very important in our type 2 diabetic patients who are either generalized obese or are having central obesity in form of uh, increased abdominal girth another popular guideline is the american association of clinical endocrinology algorithm as algorithm it suggests you treatment based upon the initial or entry level hb1c if the entry level hb1c is less than 6.5 then you should start pre diabetes algorithm if it is more than 6.5 you should start the diabetes algorithm if it is between 6.5 and 7.5 i 
according to the ACE algorithm, the monotherapy may suffice. That means either metformin or any of these drugs. And this is the suggested hierarchy of treatment, GLP-1, SGLT-2, DPP-4, pioglitazone, like that. If the entry level HbA1c is 7.5 to 9, then most probably this patient will not have control with monotherapy and they will require dual therapy. That is metformin plus a GLP-1 or SGLT-2 or DPP-4. These are having more evidence right now compared to pioglitazone and sulfonylurea and there are some safety issues. Of course, metformin will remain as background therapy in all these patients. If the entry level HbA1c is more than 9% and if patient is asymptomatic or having minimal symptoms, then maybe dual therapy or even triple therapy to start with may be required. Triple therapy means metformin plus two other agents, two other oral agents. But if patient is symptomatic with HbA1c of more than 9 or 10, symptomatic means he may be having polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia, weight loss, osmotic symptoms, genital infections. These are the symptoms which suggest that there is significant hyperglycemia and patient is having insulin deficiency at least at that point of time. And these patients are better treated initially with insulin plus or minus other agents. Later on in these patients, if they are type 2 diabetic patients, if they are having enough insulin production, after correction of the glucotoxicity, we can switch them to the oral anti-diabetic drugs. So to simplify, less than 7.5, monotherapy, 7.5 to 9, dual therapy, more than 9, asymptomatic, triple therapy, more than 9, symptomatic, insulin, plus other oral agents. And this is what the ACE algorithm is all about. Discuss some of the important drugs that we use to treat type 2 diabetes. Metformin being the basic drug. We always say that metformin is a horse which is required in all the races and it will run throughout the race. The jockeys will change and the jockeys we have are SGLT2, GLP1, sulfonylurea, DPP4, different jockeys are there. Metformin is Having enough evidence now for last 25 years after UKPDS, you may be surprised that before UKPDS trial was published, this drug was banned in USA because of the possible risk of lactic acidosis, which no longer is considered a risk now unless patient is having significant renal insufficiency. Having said that, metformin is contraindicated if the GFR is less than 30 or when patient is having acute illness like patient is hospitalized for any fever or any acute emergency, including COVID. It has some beneficial effect on the atherosclerotic vascular disease, but is neutral as far as the heart failure or the kidney disease is concerned. And the major side effect of metformin is gastrointestinal side effect, especially diarrhea. And there is potential for B12 deficiency also. So any patient on metformin, if he has neuropathic symptoms, we should remember that B12 deficiency may be there, so we need to take care of that. The second important class of agents are the SGLT2 inhibitors, which are relatively new in practice for last five years. But in last five years, they have shown with several cardiovascular and renal trials that they are very effective, not only in lowering the glucose, lowering the HbA1c, but also in reducing blood pressure, improving the lipid parameters, reducing the weight, especially the visceral obesity, and in reducing the cardiovascular complications, especially heart failure, as well as delaying the progression of the diabetic kidney disease. No other agent in past has shown so much benefit in addition to glucose control. All other agents till now have shown only reduction of the HbA1c, but SGLT2 inhibitors are the first class of agents where there is enough evidence with several trials, whether it is with empagliflozin, canagliflozin, or depagliflozin. I will not discuss the different trials here, but they are having enough evidence that they have uh, significantly reduced risk of development of cardiovascular disease as well as the renal disease. The drawback is that they cannot be used if the GFR is less than 30 or 25 because they work through kidneys. Not that they will harm kidney, but 
they will become less effective because their action is through the renal tubules. Moreover, there are some other risks also, and the main risk is the genitourinary infection because these drugs work through excreting glucose through urine. There is about 70 to 80 gram of glucose loss per day that is equivalent to 320 calories per day. But due to that glucose loss in urine, patients are susceptible to genitourinary infection, balanitis in male and vaginal candidiasis in female. So unless you have explained proper hygiene to the patient, this drug may become uh, burdensome because of the side effect. Moreover, they also cause significant diuresis and that's why there is some risk of volume depression, which should be taken care of. Some other side effects include euglycemic ketosis, but if judiciously used, they are very good drugs to start with along with metformin in type 2 diabetic patients. The third agents which we will discuss here are GLP-1 analogs. And in our country, liraglutide, dulaglutide, these two are available. Soon, semaglutide will be available in oral form. Right now, the injectable GLP-1 which are available is liraglutide and dulaglutide. Liraglutide is once a day, dulaglutide is just once a week. The advantage of these agents are that they can cause weight loss and they are also having cardio-renal benefit. Major problems are they are having significant gastrointestinal side effect in form of nausea, vomiting, sometimes diarrhea. They are injectable drugs and there is some risk of acute pancreatitis. Of course, this risk is not seen in the clinical trials. Moreover, they are quite expensive and may cost about 10,000 rupees a month, which is beyond uh, reach of many of our patients. The other drugs that are used are DPP-4 inhibitors or popularly known as gliptins, where we have citagliptin, linagliptin, tenagliptin, vildagliptin, and some other gliptins. These are effective, but not as effective as GLP-1 and SGLT-2. They can reduce HbA1c by about 0.7 to 1%. The benefit of DPP-4 inhibitor is they are absolutely safe drugs. They do not have any major side effects. They are very safe as far as management of type 2 diabetes is concerned. But there is no cardiac or renal benefit associated with that. But at the same time, they do not harm the heart as well as kidney and can be used even with advanced kidney disease. Then comes the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, that is acarbose and voglibose. They are good drugs, but they reduce only the postprandial hyperglycemia. They do not have any effect on the fasting glucose. The major side effect is gastrointestinal, flatulence, sometimes diarrhea, otherwise they are also safe drugs. Then comes pioglitazone, which is a controversial drug, but quite effective and actually is having atherosclerotic vascular disease benefit. But the problem is it can cause salt water retention, weight gain, and can precipitate heart failure also because of the salt water retention properties. The drug was in debate due to bladder con cancer controversy, but that has now been removed, especially in India, the risk of bladder cancer with pyogotazone is absolutely low. Sulfonylurea still remain the popular drugs, glimepiride, gliclazide, glipizide, glibenthamide. They are potent drugs, but the only problem with them is they can cause sometimes severe hypo, especially if patient has not taken proper meal, and they also cause some weight gain. They are having no cardiovascular benefit, but they are neutral as far as the cardiovascular risk is concerned. Time-tested molecules, they are otherwise safe, except for the risk of hypoglycemia. So when patient has mild hyperglycemia, it is better to avoid sulfonylurea. The other class of agents still now I discussed, do not cause hypoglycemia. I would say that they are anti-hyperglycemic drugs, whereas sulfonylureas can cause hypoglycemia. And finally, insulin. And insulin, in we have short-acting or rapid-acting insulins, intermediate-acting insulins, pre-mix insulin, and long-acting insulins as well. I'll not go into details about insulin. Whichever algorithm you like, one should follow them, either ACE algorithm or AD algorithm. And even ACE algorithm suggests that even at pre-diabetes, we should start some form of therapy. Moreover, in addition to, sorry, 
in addition to treating glycemia in every diabetic patient we must assess the cardiovascular risk and if the cardiovascular risk is significant we must treat their dyslipidemia also with statin if triglyceride remains more than 500 in spite of statin then fibrin may be added or omega 3 fatty acid we also need to treat hypertension with either ace or arb to start with and then maybe calcium channel blocker beta blocker thiazide or whatever therapy is required so a b c all three things have to be treated a is even c b is blood pressure c is cholesterol if you really want a comprehensive control of type 2 diabetes in reducing the complications you may be aware about the omina octet described by de fronzo in 2009 in diabetes which means that previously and the conventional teaching has been that diabetes results due to two basic defects one is insulin resistance second is insulin secretion yes of course these two defects are still basic but in addition to that there are other factors also which is known as the omina octet number one is of course the insulin resistance leading to increase in lipolysis decrease glucose uptake at the muscle level and increase hepatic glucose output from the liver then there is beta cell effect resulting into decrease in insulin secretion but at the same time in type 2 diabetes there is alpha cell defect beta cell secrete less insulin but in turn alpha cell maybe due to paracrine effect or whatever starts secreting more glucagon and that also leads to hyperglycemia moreover kidneys actually should be throwing away more glucose in diabetes but unfortunately in type 2 diabetic patients kidneys threshold goes up and they cannot excrete glucose to the extent that they actually should be excreting and that is why kidneys actually try and preserve more glucose leading to hyperglycemia again moreover there is neurotransmitter dysfunction also which means that the brain also plays a central role in causation as well as in the precipitation of hyperglycemia and finally there is decrease in creatinine effect that means if you give glucose orally from intestine the intestinal ail cells will secrete glp1 which would in turn stimulate insulin secretion but that does not happen in diabetes patient to a magnitude that it would happen in a non diabetic which is called in creatinine defect so diabetes results as a combination of this unfortunately the guidelines suggest that you should start only metformin when hb1c is in the range of 7 and we'll come back to this case again that when hb1c is 7 what therapy should be given so guidelines suggest that start only with metformin but unfortunately metformin works only on the liver so if you look at this omina octet metformin works only at this one level that is increase hepatic glucose output metformin does not have any effect of any on, on uh, any effect on any of this so even if metformin may be effective initially over a period of time its effect will wane and patient may experience hyperglycemia leading to complications so the current concept is at start something along with metformin so that not only glucose is taken care of but the pathophysiology of the disease is also taken care of and this is how we treat all the diseases how do we treat pneumonia we don't treat fever we don't treat cough we treat the root cause of course the root cause is bacteria of course this days in the covid era root cause has changed from bacteria to virus but i mean to say that any disease we should be treating not the numbers not just the hb1c but we should be treating the underlying pathophysiology of the disease and the pathophysiology of the diabetes lies in this eight factors and that's why right from the beginning we should be taking care of most of these etiological factors most of these pathogenic factors which cause diabetes and if you treat them well probably you will have a long term diabetes control second reason for not starting metformin alone is metformin is a good drug for fasting hyperglycemia early on in type 2 diabetes especially when hb1c is in the range of 7 7.5 
Postmenial contributes very significantly to the HbA1c. And metformin, being a drug for fasting, may not be very good for postprandial hyperglycemia. So in spite of giving metformin, your fasting may come down, but postprandial may not come down, and you may experience uh, less than expected HbA1c reduction. So for reducing postprandial, we need an agent which will take care of postprandial also. The most effective strategy in reducing the postprandial for our Indian patients is restriction of the carbohydrate. Whatever we take in our diet, maybe from breakfast to dinner, contains carbohydrate, carbohydrate, and carbohydrate. Whether you are staying in West or whether you are staying in North or South, anywhere in India, our diet right from breakfast to dinner is only carbohydrate. If you are in Punjab, you may be eating alu paratha. If you are in Bengal, you may be eating a lot of rice. If you are in Chennai, you may be eating idli. And if you are in Ahmedabad, you may be eating kakra. And if you are a little bit westernized, then you may be eating cereals or breads. All of these are carbohydrates. So we must remember that the first important thing which we should do in type 2 diabetes management is restriction of carbohydrate, especially the simple carbohydrate, and restriction of fat. Along with that, exercise also plays a very important role. We'll not discuss that because of the paucity of time here. Uh, but if you look at the natural history of diabetes also, diabetes begins postprandially and progresses postprandially. And by giving metformin alone, you will target fasting and postprandial may be missed. And that's why patient may have less desirable glycemic control. Moreover, Diabetes is not just a disease of blood sugar, it is a disease of cardiovascular system, it is a disease of renal system. So right from day one, our aim should be to reduce or prevent the chances of cardiovascular and renal complications. Since 2008, US FDA has mandated cardiovascular safety for any agent. And metformin has cardiovascular safety but not benefit. The benefit is shown only in the UK PDS trials. Subsequent trials have not shown. Whereas the GLP-1 analogs as well as the SGLT2 inhibitors have shown significant cardiovascular benefit. Again, I will not go into details of this slide. Especially heart failure because the risk of heart failure is also very high in type 2 diabetes patients. And all this study including Empare, Canvas, Declaratimi, Credence have shown that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of heart failure by about 30 to 40 percent. So we should be using them early in the disease. Of course, having said that, we must take care of the genitourinary part or the infection part of these patients. Comparing SGLT2 and GLP-1, both are having cardiovascular benefit, but the benefit of SGLT2 starts much earlier then compared to the GLP-1 analog. And again, they are oral therapy, much less expensive and well tolerated compared to the GLP-1 analogs. Several trials, including Empare, Canvas, have shown its cardiovascular benefit as well as the renal benefit. So coming back to this case, what should we start? Now I think the verdict is clear. We should start with lifestyle plus oral anti-diabetic therapy combination. The ideal in this patient may be metformin plus SGLT2 because this patient is overweight, is having cardiovascular family history, and may be having some other cardiovascular risk factors also. If patient is not able to afford or tolerate SGLT2, then one can consider metformin plus a DPP4 inhibitor. Since his HbA1c is only 7, giving him sulfonylurea may increase the risk of hypoglycemia. So at this point of time, we should be avoiding the drugs that cause hypoglycemia and we should be using the drugs that are devoid of that side effect. So all these are devoid of that side effect. GLP-1, of course, probably the topmost agents amongst all this, but as I said, it is injectable, quite expensive, and is associated with gastrointestinal side effects. And that's why the overall acceptance and adherence rate of GLP-1 therapy in practice is low. And that's why uh, it is not that much encouraged ahead of SGLT2 and DPP-4 inhibitors. What else? 
Of course, we have taken care of just glucose till now. We must take care of his lipid levels. We must take care of his blood pressure also. Even if it is marginally elevated, in diabetes patient, our target should be to keep it below 138 if possible. If he is a smoker or tobacco chewer, avoiding that is also very important. And if he is overweight, reduction of body weight is also going to be extremely important. So statin, RAS blocker, maybe ACE inhibitor or ARB, smoking cessation, weight reduction, how about aspirin? Well, previously, aspirin was considered gold standard for cardiovascular disease prevention. But of late, the trials for primary prevention have shown that aspirin may have a doubtful role in primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. For secondary prevention, that means if patient is already having cardiovascular disease, there is no doubt that we have to give aspirin along with statin. But if patient does not have cardiovascular disease and is does not having significant cardiovascular risk factors, then primary preventive role of aspirin is right now debated. So I would mean to say that we need a comprehensive control and for that we have designed this blue index which comprises of 10 parameters. It is going to represent the overall health of the diabetes patient, not just the glucose control. So there are 10 parameters in that. A is A1C, B is blood pressure, C is cholesterol, D is diet and in diet we should take care of the calorie content, the carbohydrate content and the meal pattern and the irregularities of the meal. E is exercise where aerobic, weight resistance exercise and the work related activity, all this should be taken care of. F is follow up, if patient is not following up with the doctor regularly, he is likely to miss his goal, he is likely to have uncontrolled hypertension and that may lead to uh, complications. So follow up is also extremely important. In addition to that, the general health of diabetes patient depends on his overall happiness, his mental status, and whether he is having obesity or not, whether he is having obstructive sleep apnea or not, and how good is his liver. Because in diabetic patient, there is significantly increased risk of non-alcoholic or metabolic associated fatty liver disease. H is habits, that is avoidance of habits, including smoking, tobacco, and alcohol, if it is a habit. I is infection prevention. And never in the past, infection prevention had been so important before this COVID era. We know that uncontrolled diabetic patients are at more risk of developing COVID as well as COVID-related complications, and that should be taken care of. So infection prevention is also a very important strategy in diabetes treatment. And finally, J, the geopardy of diabetes management, which, which means whatever drugs we may be giving may be having some side effects. So explaining and taking care of them, identifying them very early are the keys to avoid the side effects of diabetes uh, management. And finally, the K, the complications of diabetes must be prevented. And if complications are detected, that progression should be prevented and the complications should be treated in time. We know the chronic complications. I will not discuss the acute complications, but the chronic complications, you know, are macro or cardiovascular complications, including the cerebrovascular, coronary artery disease and heart failure and peripheral arterial disease. The microvascular complication include the kidney, that is diabetic uh, nephropathy, nerves that is diabetic neuropathy and eyes that is diabetic retinopathy. So this should also be identified early, prevented and treated early. And finally, the foot complications are also extremely important in diabetes and foot complications are a result of micro, macro, bone related problem, infection, skin related changes, everything. So it's altogether a different thing. So having discussed this case, if there are any questions, we'll discuss them at the end. And now I'll just run through some two or three important cases, which are also very common in our day-to-day -day diabetes practice. This is a case of a 35-year-old gentleman. He is newly detected to have diabetes and has come to you with 360 blood sugar fasting, 380 PPBS, HbA1c is 11. 
He has 7 kg of weight loss. His blood pressure is normal. He is not overweight. He is having BMI of 24. Can anyone tell me that what type of diabetes is it? And what treatment you will give? I will give you half a minute. Can anyone type their answer here on the chat? This is the case. Okay. So this patient is having significant insulin deficiency to start with. His fasting is 360. HB1C is 11. He has significant weight loss. He is not overweight. He is young. So probably this may not be type 2 diabetes. This may be type 1 or this may be latent autoimmune diabetes of adult or called LADA, which is also a slow type 1 diabetes. So this can be anything, type 1, LADA or type 2. But at least till, uh, at least till we prove that, we should treat him with an agent that will take care of his insulin deficiency. He is insulin deficient at this point of time and that's why we need to start insulin. Maybe basal therapy or basal bolus therapy. In this therapy, we need to treat him aggressively with premix insulin rather than treating him with oral anti-diabetic agents. So let me see how many of you answered that start with insulin and not with the oral agents. We'll discuss that later. So this patient was started with premix insulin twice a day. Premix insulin, the examples are human mix star, human insulin 3070, no mix 30, or humalog mix 25. These are the examples of premix insulin. After achieving control, insulin was gradually reduced and metformin was started. And the currently, and currently the patient is on metformin 1000 milligram and cetagliptin 100 milligram. How did this happen? Probably this patient came with glucotoxicity. And once we gave him insulin, his glucotoxicity was reversed. And the beta cells, which had become non-functional, started becoming functional again, started secreting enough insulin, and now patient can be maintained on the oral anti-diabetic therapy with very good HbA1c control. Is this possible? Similar second case, 37-year-old male, 65 kg weight, 10 kg weight loss, and fasting 300, postprandial 500 plus, HbA1c was 12.5 to start with. We started with basal bolus therapy, and after Achieving control, he was shifted to premix BID. Currently, this patient is not on any OAD or insulin for the last 10 years and his HbA1c is remaining around 6. Is this possible? Yes. There have been now several reports and in our own experience also of more than 1,500 patients by now where we have treated with early intensive insulin therapy. It can reverse hyperglycemia. It can reduce the cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. Short-term intensive control. This is a Chinese study, but there are now UK, European, American, as well as Indian studies to support that, that early insulin therapy in patients with insulin deficiency can restore insulin sensitivity as well as beta cell function. You might be aware about the reversal of diabetes now. The uh, Roy Taylor's theory of reversing diabetes, that if you control diabetes early on, aggressively, then in some of the patients, you may be even able to have long-term remission of diabetes. So previously, when anyone came to us, we would say that diabetes can only be controlled. It cannot be reversed. It cannot be cured. But now we know that with aggressive medical as well as diet-related therapy early on in the disease, reversal is also a possibility. Of course, it is not easy, it is not practicable in all the patients, and it is not possible in all the patients, but still, in appropriate candidates, this must be tried. Okay. And that is my case number five. 
patient admitted for covid is detected to have new onset hyperglycemia and some of you may be managing this type of patients in the wards if you are attending the wards these days i am not sure whether uh, you are allowed to attend the wards or you are just doing the uh, covid duty outside the hospital uh, that is in the uh, urban health centers but anyway a patient with covid is detected to have new onset hyperglycemia how will you manage now the management will be different if patient is critically ill or if patient is not critically ill but in the ward if patient is critically ill we need to manage this patient with iv insulin continuous infusion in a critically ill patient who cannot be relied upon to take enough food or maybe on intravenous therapy then subcutaneous insulin may not be that much appropriate and effective so we need to give iv insulin continuous infusion and usually human short acting insulin or human atropid is used for insulin uh, for infusion in an infusion pump the dose we have to decide based upon is glucose values and how he follows uh, again because of paucity of time we will not go into details of that if patient is not critically ill admitted in a ward or a room with covid then again basal bolus insulin therapy which means a short acting insulin before every meal that is bolus and basal insulin that is a long acting insulin like glargin daily once a day that is called basal bolus therapy later on once the patient is stable and is discharged if appropriate he can be shifted to the oral anti diabetic therapy these days we know that covid patients receive steroids and because of that also some of them develop hyperglycemia and they need to be treated at least at that point of time how do we differentiate that this is new onset hyperglycemia or the patient was already having diabetes and not diagnosed hb1c will give you a clue if hb1c is less than 6 it would suggest that the patient is newly detected to have diabetes because of either covid illness or because of the stress hormones that are related due to the stress uh, infection or due to the steroid therapy but if hb1c is more than 7 or 7.5 this patient was likely to have diabetes but was not diagnosed he is now diagnosed since he has come to the hospital and you have checked finally my last slide case number 6 year old male fasting 140 post mental 200 hbc 7.5 very active all other reports are normal what are the treatment options will you start with monotherapy combination therapy insulin glp sglt2 well i'll not give any treatment to him he has lived for 90 years happily all other reports are normal forget about his treatment right but there are very few so lucky people who do not require any treatment for everyone else there is a treatment with us so that we can manage them to help them live long to prevent their complications and to give them a very good quality of life with this i would end and my final uh, uh, word for every one of you is stay safe during this covid uh, uh, era especially all of you performing covid duties need to take special care not only for yourself but for your parents as well as grandparents if you are staying with them thank you very much for your very kind audience i would stop sharing here and if there are any questions i am here here to address them it was a great session sir uh, we do have a few questions Uh, yep. also audience on youtube live stream can also ask questions why do some cases go undetected for a long time what signs can we look out for to detect cases early on yes and it's a very good question why some patients are not diagnosed in time well diabetes remains asymptomatic for quite some time some of the patients may be having diabetes for 5 years and may go unnoticed because in 50% 50 0 of the diabetes patients there are no symptoms the commonest symptom of diabetes is being asymptomatic the typical symptoms that are explained in the books like polyuria polyphagia polydipsia fatigue genital infection 
All this occur when there is significant hyperglycemia, maybe in the tune of 250-300 or when the HbA1c is more than 9 or 10. Patients with 7.58 HbA1c may not have any symptoms and that is why unless you test annually after the age of 30 years, diabetes may remain undetected. And even when hyperglycemia is not severe, if not treated, patient can end up into long-term complications like retinopathy, nephropathy, cardiovascular complications. So the message is diagnose early, treat early to prevent complications. Um, next question. Why is there a requirement in Indian demographics to start with combinations when guidelines say to start with only metformin? Oh, yes. It's a very good question. So, don't write in exams. In exams, you are supposed to write guideline-based answers, right? But in practice, see, previously the guidelines were based upon that start with monotherapy, then step up, then step up. But as I rightly said that if you start only with one agent, it will take care of one or two pathophysiological factors, right? We are not treating diabetes to see good numbers. We are treating diabetes to prevent complications. So if you want to prevent complications, we should be proactive. We should not be doing a failure-based management. Don't allow it to increase. And that is the key. And that's why we recommend combination early on rather than uh, delaying the combination. Previously, the guidelines were like this because the second drug you add may cause hypoglycemia because the previous drugs, the older drugs like sulfonylurea and insulin, if started very early, may cause hypoglycemia. And that's why the guidelines were like that. Guidelines will emerge over a period of time, maybe after two or three years, they will say that start with combination straight away. But guidelines require enough trial evidence. The practice does not require that much evidence. Practice requires evidence, guidelines, as well as the common sense. But having said that, in exams, you are supposed to write guideline-based answers and not what I told in this talk. Okay, thank you. What is metabolic syndrome and what is its relation with DM? Metabolic syndrome, as I described, comprises of five factors. One is central obesity, waist circumference, more than 19 males, or 80, 85 in females. Second is dyslipidemia, that is atherogenic dyslipidemia, TG more than 150, HDL less than 35. Third, blood pressure, hypertension, so 140, 90 or more. Uh, so four criteria, TG, HDL, uh, central obesity, hypertension, and the fifth criteria is either impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes. So if any of these three criteria are met, patient is classified to have metabolic syndrome. Why it is important? Because metabolic syndrome patients are at risk of developing diabetes as well as cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Uh, considering all investigative tests that diagnose DM have been discovered in modern times, is diabetes a modern disease or has it been present all along? Uh, well, uh, it was present all along. Previously, people used to live only 50 years. And this is a disease, not of elderly, but usually type 2 diabetes starts at the age of 40, 45. So previously, either it remained undiagnosed, but of late, the prevalence has increased because of the lifestyle changes. The life 50 years back was very simple. The requirements were very minimal. A girl was and all this increases stress. Moreover, the physical activity has gone down significantly. And our diets, our Indian diet was never good. It was a lot of carbohydrates. But now we also eat Indian fast foods. We eat the Western fast foods also. So we have combined, we have taken bad things from them and forgotten good things. So because of all these factors, the prevalence has increased significantly and it will go on increasing. 
can type 2 diabetes go away if my blood sugar becomes normal do i still have diabetes and do i yes. still have to take the medication yes yes so it's a, again a very good question can diabetes be reversed yes if a person weighing 90 kg can lose his weight by about 15 kg in initial years after diagnosis his diabetes can be reversed and if you want details about that you can read roy taylor's direct trial where he had reversal of about 57% of his patients by giving him uh, giving the patients a restricted calorie diet of 800 calories for 3 to 6 months and he could reverse diabetes by about 85% in some of the patients that is possible but it is not easy to achieve but yes if patient is taking medicines and if his blood sugar is coming normal his hbo1c has normalized then we can say that his diabetes is under control we cannot say that he has been cured of diabetes so control is different cure is different cure means no therapy for more than one year and still his hbo1c remains below 5.7 that is cure that is possible not impossible but not so easy okay can diabetic ne- neuropathy nephropathy or retinopathy be reversed with a ketogenic diet and how like is it proven oh uh with ketogenic diet you cannot reverse nephropathy neuropathy and retinopathy ketogenic diet will actually do more harm in the long term for short term yes for short term it may cause good weight loss and can cause uh, some important metabolic improvements but if patient already has retinopathy if patient already has neuropathy there is no evidence that ketogenic diet may improve or reverse that actually there have been reports that it may even worsen that so ketogenic diets are not generally advisable in long term there may be okay. short term benefits but long term there may be harms are there any different symptoms of diabetes in men and women uh gender specific differences are well uh women probably have more symptoms of any disease compared to men that is one thing second is the genital infections genital infections occur more commonly in women the vaginal candidiasis in men also especially when they are non circumcised uh, circumcised they also experience balanitis but if patient is circumcised then the balanitis will not occur generally moreover in males uh, there may be erectile dysfunction related to uncontrolled diabetes which is much more common in the uh, or the rather sexual dysfunction is much more common in the males and erectile dysfunction obviously is unique for the males only so these are the only differences otherwise there are no differences in the uh, male and female as far as the symptoms are concerned complications wise if you ask cardiovascular complications usually in a non diabetic patient are more common in male but if a person is diabetic diabetes erases their hormonal protection so if a woman is diabetic she is no longer protected because of the estrogen from cardiovascular complications so they compete with males as far as the cardiovascular complications are concerned in a non diabetic cardiovascular complications are much more in males compared to females but in diabetes it is equal uh if i am at high risk of getting diabetes how often should i be getting checked and starting from which age yes for indians or asians because we are in the high risk category after the age of 30 ideally one should uh, get the blood glucose test every 3 years according to the guidelines but according to the indian consensus every 1 year but if you look at the american diabetes association consensus every 3 years why 3 years because even if you detect 2 years later you may not have developed advanced complications but having said that in indian patients it is better to have diabetes testing done at least once in a year after the age of 30 especially if you are having family history or you are having obesity or having any of the 
uh, other features of metabolic syndrome like uh, central obesity or uh, hypertension or anything like that. So once in a year after age of 30. Uh, thank you, sir. That's all the questions uh, that we got. Uh, thank you for the great session and the amazing uh, question answer session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Dhruvam. Thank you, the whole MCON team. And once again, everyone, take care, stay safe. Good evening and Jai. Goodbye. Uh, now I would like to introduce the organizing secretary. Uh, now I would like to introduce the organizing secretary of AMCON 2020, Purvi Chaudhara. Uh, hello everyone, myself Purvi Chaudhara and uh, it is my privilege to get a chance to say something after all such wonderful speeches. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone who has been associated with this conference uh, since the beginning and uh, has been given every minute effort to make this possible today. I would also like to uh, thank. Uh, uh, I would also like to thank all the professors, our respected deans, hers, the members of our scientific committee, and the judges who gave their valuable time to us, who are guiding us throughout the conference and uh, for making it possible in this pandemic times. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank each and every one of you. I know this was not the AMCON we dreamt of in uh, March, but this was possibly. Uh, the best we could do and it feels uh, it makes my heart fill with immense pleasure that we could do this and we finally did this uh, lastly wishing everyone uh, all the very best for the upcoming exams and i hope you had amazing time organizing this had all the fun make, made many memories and a lot of friendships thank you Uh, hi, can everyone please switch on their uh, cameras for a photo?
everyone uh, please unmute your uh, please uh, keep your video on for the photo Unfortunately, we couldn't see all your faces in March 2020 because of the pandemic. We hope you enjoyed our online edition of Famcon 2020 right from your own homes. Thank you to all the participants and the keynote speakers for making this event successful. I would also like to thank my colleagues and my seniors for all the hard work and the perseverance without which this wouldn't have been possible. We're very grateful for this opportunity to bring an online edition of the conference according to the new normal. the keynote speeches in the morning and the ones right now were very helpful and you can watch them again on our youtube channel thank you for joining us today hope to see you in person for amcon 2021 stay happy healthy and safe